Hello, hello, hello guys and welcome back to Joe's Ventures and today we're going to be doing part 84 of our Planet Zoo uh, mod spotlights where we take a look at some of the wonderful mods people have been making and use them to talk and learn about some of the wonderful biodiversity that we share our world with. And today we've got a lot of fish and lots of really cool um, marine and freshwater animals that we're going to talk about. So uh, it's a couple of things kind of out the box, but I think it's going to be very, very interesting to talk about. So we're going to be starting off with our first one. This comes from Leaf, Buffsu, and Fire, uh, Free 3D. So this is uh, another port. We have got this guy here. We have got the Mana Kapuru, um, Mana Kapuru Angelfish. And this is not actually its own species. This is a kind of locale or variant or morph. Uh, so this is, again, not its own species. So these are geographic variant or from a locale is kind of the term typically in the hobby. Um, they're distinctive uh, from other locales and populations of uh, angelfish because of this red orange coloration that goes from their back up to their dorsal fin here um and these guys are very similar to uh, other angelfish locales very peaceful uh quite tall like this very interesting for a cichlid as well and these guys are indigenous to the manacapuru river in northwestern brazil so this is where the only place you can find this locale of fish other than obviously in the hobby but really really awesome these guys typically live in habitats that are heavily planted with rock formations and uh, heavy plants and gentle flows so they don't like strong currents uh, and they prefer the cover of plants for things like that. They're also generally compatible with most fish in aquariums though they will eat sm small like shrimps and small invertebrates even small fish as well they can eat because they're t typically carnivorous. Um, these guys get to about um, the scientific name is um, Terophyllum um, scuculae mangocapu, uh, or manacapu. So this is kind of their variant version. So it, it distinguishes them from other populations of uh, angelfish. Uh, these guys are carnivorous as well. They like tr tr tropical waters between 26 and 28 degrees Celsius. Uh, and they are approximately about 15 centimeters long uh, from this site here. But they get typically the same size as your regular angelfish just uh the main difference as i mentioned is kind of this reddish orange uh stripe that goes on their body here but really really awesome regardless again done by leaf buffsu and free 3d next we're going to move on to another one we've got another species here we've got the um angemara or you have to say it or the wolf fish uh which is not to be confused with the one from last time this is more of a freshwater fish so these guys are also from South America. These guys in Amazonia, the native populations also contain high amounts of mercury as well. And they're the largest of their genus, the Papaya species. Specimens have been caught up to about 120 centimeters long or 47 inches, with the largest rod and reel record stands at about 101 centimeters or about 40 inches and can weigh as much as 40 kilograms or um, 88 pounds. So they also have this the elongated um, cylinder body with these like dark scales with a lighter base color as you can kind of see here so darker scales with a little bit of counter shading going on there as well with uh, a number of vertical patterns and stripes on their fins as you can kind of see here on their body it's really really cool the cat color can also be like almost completely black but they've normally got this kind of mod uh brownish mottled color to them which is a really interesting look and they've also got pretty big teeth which is also really cool and they've actually been known to, uh, though they're considered docile, they've been known to account uh, attacks divers and swimmers. And this can be quite dangerous because obviously a big fish biting you is not good. But they typically don't really have a fatal ending. It's just a big fish that gives you a big bite. So in terms of this habitat, these guys are found across most of northern South America, Brazil, Colombia, Venezuela, Guiana, French Guiana, uh, Trinidad, and Suriname. So these guys uh, are... Quite common around those areas. They're typically only found in common current zones and primary rivers and creeks where these guys are mainly ambush predators and they will feed opportunist opportunistically on pretty much what animal falls into the water. That includes terrestrial invertebrates and attacks on larger invertebrates including humans are unproven uh, and they are predominantly active at dusk or at night 
Uh, reproduction takes place on the onset of the raining season from December to March, and depending on its size, these guys can carry between 6,000 and 60,000 eggs. And they're known for the qual uh, quality of its flesh, so they're quite a good eating fish. But some populations uh, have been severely depleted because of fishing, and also uh, some they have high concentrations of mercury because of um, leaking stuff into the rivers. And it's actually a really good bioindicator to tell the health of the rivers, because most of this mercury bioaccumulates into these guys, since these guys are top predators, and are really, really awesome. So yes, yeah, smaller vertebrates... Um, Pretty much any small fish, these guys are pretty generous in that regard, they'll eat whatever they can. Really, really awesome fish here, done by Leaf Buffsu and Porter from Fishing Planet. Another awesome fish there, so it looks like we're going to uh, really go through these. So next we have got the Tiger Muscalunge, or the Tiger uh, Musky by Leaf and Buffsu. So this is actually not its own species, this is a hybrid. So this is a hybrid of um, the True Muscalunge and the Northern Pike, which are both in the same genus. So they sometimes, in the wild, or even in captivity, they are bred to hybridize together and they create the tiger muskie. And these guys are the hybrid offspring of these species and they typically are sterile. So um, they actually grow quite quickly um, and they grow about one and a half times faster than a muscalunge. And they said to have hybrid vigor that allows them to grow faster and stronger than their parent fish and be more resistant to disease. So um, in terms of their natural quote-unquote habitat, they live in rivers in Canada, in the Great Lakes, in the Upper Mississippi, in the St. Lawrence and Ohio rivers as well. Um, they're really found from its natural uh, waters, except from fish that's been stocked, because they, uh, they are a hybrid. Hybridization is not that common in nature. It does happen a lot, but it's not that common. And typically they are stocked. Each tiger muskie tends to inhabit the same areas of the lake from year to year, and they tend to live in shallow waters between 2 to 3 meters, or 6 to 9 feet deep and travel half as much in the summer and fall than they do in the winter and spring, uh, when it prefers deeper waters of about 5, point no, uh, 5 to 9 meters or 15 to 30 feet deep. So in terms of the characteristics, they're kind of, again, a kind of a blend of the muscalunge and the pike. Uh, you can see they've got the long body of a muscalunge and that kind of long face as well, but they also got that cool pattern there that's going on there, uh, and these fins are like more rounded than those of true muskies as well. And um, yeah, they vary a lot from dark stripes to spots, which is uh, the opposite color scheme of the pike, so it kind of mixes together. Really, really interesting hybrid here, and it's cool that we get to talk about them. So in terms of these guys, they typically feed uh, as both northern pikes and muscalunge do. They wait near weeds and ambush its prey. They have food preferences similar to those of true muskies and northern pikes as well. They seem to prefer larger fish during the summer and fall. Uh, in preparation for winter, and these guys will eat anything from yellow perch, suckers, uh, golden shiners, walleri, and smallmouth bass, as well as many other types of fish. But expanding out of that, they will eat crayfish, frogs, ducklings, mice, muskrats, small mammals, and small birds. So they're quite generous in that regard, um, generalists, so they'll feed on whatever they really can get their mouths around. And in terms of their reproduction uh, and their growth and survival, these guys can get as big as about 4.5 kilograms or 10 pounds, depending on the state. And because they're typically bred for stocking, uh, they've been made them to look into their uh, growth rates. There's been studies to look at that, and they tend to grow quite well. They grow quite a bit faster than other, um, both of their parent species, which is pretty interesting. And it shows that these guys, as they grow longer, they also increase in weight as well. So they just grow fast and really good for stocking, obviously, in ponds and things like that. So crossbreeding of the true muscalunge and the northern pike does happen in the wild, where both parent species occur. But typically, this tiger muskie is sterile, so it does not able to reproduce. So it just kind of... they the parents hybridize and the baby can live out its life if it manages, but it can't reproduce, which is not unusual for a hybrid fish. And breeders prefer to breed male northern pikes and female muscalunge because the eggs are less um, adhesive and they have less tendency to clump while hatching. Though while some of them occur naturally in the wild, most are bred in these hatcheries. And tiger muskies usually grow more quickly than the pure strain muskie and northern pikes for the first several years. And they also endure high temperatures better than the parent fish, which makes them quicker to grow and able to better able get to legal size sooner, which makes them more useful for stocking fish. So if they want to put fish out in the water, this is kind of the perfect one for you for angling and sport. And the tiger muskie is renowned as a sport fish and they can get up to about 130 centimeters or 50 inches long. And they can be caught in lakes and reservoirs with purely of foliage and stuff like that. And being large, powerful fish, they are quite fun to uh, 
angle because they obviously give up a bit of a fight, but they are difficult to manage. And um, they typically hide near the edge of wheat beds and weeds and stuff like that so they can ambush their prey. And um, yeah, just a really, really interesting fish. Uh, it's kind of a hybrid. I love talking about hybrids. I uh, remember talking about, I know there's some other hybrids going on like um, ligers and stuff like that I was going to cover a while ago, but never really got around to it, like zonkeys and ligers. But still, really, really cool fish. Uh, next, we're going to move it on to the six line wrasse. So that one was done by Leaf and Buffsu. This one's done by Leaf, Buffsu, and Free TD as well. So this is the six line wrasse over here. At least it should be. Yeah, there we are. Cute little fella. Let's see if you can find the other one. They're kind of hard to find, to be honest, just because they're so small. But yeah, we'll have a... Oh, there's one. Swimming around. Let's have a look at you. So this is the six line wrasse. So these are a species of marine wraith and fish that have found widely across the Indo-Pacific. And they're commonly associated with coral reefs, because that's where they live. And they're quite common in the aquarium trade. And luckily, you consider least concern, so that's good. Uh, these guys are very small species, and the maximum length they get is about 10 centimeters long. And um, they are violet in color, and you can see the six orange stripes going down their back, where they get the name, the six stripe uh, wrasse. And they also have this small eye spot, as you can kind of see here. And on the base of the caudal fin, uh, blue stripe along its anal fin, and the uh, blue streak on its pelvic fin, with these red eyes going on here. So a really, really cool fish. So these guys, in terms of the distribution, they're found in the eastern coast of Africa, where they're found in the Red Sea to South Africa, across the Indian and Western Pacific Oceans. And they range as north as Japan, and as south as the northern Australia, and as east far as Tumatu, which is pretty cool. So these guys, in terms of their habitat, let's see if we can find another one swimming around. Well, these guys are kind of doing their own thing. Anyway, so in terms of their habitat, a couple of variation there, which is pretty awesome. Let's have a look at this one, because this one's quite bright. But typically, in terms of uh, the habitat, they live in the branches of corals and sea uh, wood reefs, where they can be found in like clear coastal waters with dense coral growth. And they've been recorded to depths of about 20 meters or 66 feet, feet but they generally live a little bit uh, higher than that. Uh, they've been recorded uh, this being sensitive in shy, so they normally uh, are encountered in small, loose groups that swim along the branches of corals which they use for protection. And in terms of their diet, they typically feed on small crustaceans, but they've been also recorded being uh, cleaner fish. So they will remove um, exoparasites such as isopods and copepods from other fish. And in the Unzu Islands of Japan, this uh, spawning takes place during the sunset and the paired adults undertake a very quick dash towards the surface to spawn. And the speed of this dash is reduces the risk of predation by other fish. And this is a diurnal species which takes shelter in crevasses and when they create a mucus a mucus cocoon where they allow them to sleep during the night and it's thought that this cocoon helps protect it from natural uh, from nocturnal predators by masking the uh, fish's scent so that's really cool another really cool thing about the ecology let's see if we can find another one swimming around this guy's just having a sleep well this one's swimming a really cute little guy if i do say so myself so these guys, as I mentioned, they're quite popular in the aquarium trade, though they do not breed well, so most of them are wild caught, so just let you know. Um, the species collected by food by sea gypsies, <laughs> which is a funny name, in some parts of Thailand, so they can't, can be a food uh, species. And as I mentioned, generally considered least concerned, so they have a wide range, but obviously things like climate change and ocean acidification can hurt the habitats like corals, so that's um, very not good, but also very awesome fish. So next we're going to move on to, this one was done by Leaf Buff Suit and Free 3D. This next one's from Ultimate Fishing Simulator. We have got a really cool fish here. We've got the Lump Sucker. Let's see if you can find one swimming around. Where's the one swimming the lumps? There's a Lump Sucker. I love a Lump. Ooh, no, that's not what we want. We want to have a look at this Lump Sucker. This is from Ultimate Fishing Simulator. So this is the Lump Sucker. There's lots of species of Lump Sucker, but this is the main species that's probably the most common talked about. This is the um, Cyptoterra subclipa, uh, I can't even speak properly. Um, this is Cleptoterus lumpus, or the lump sucker, or just the lump fish. These guys are marine fish and the only member of their genus. These guys are found in the northern Atlantic and adjacent parts of the Arctic Ocean, so they reign as far south as Chesapeake Bay and uh, the North American coast and Spain, that they can be really seen in the um, English, past the English Channel. But these guys are, are really cool fish. Uh, these guys are sexually dimorphic, with females reaching larger sizes than the males, 
with males typically reaching about 30 to 40 centimeters or 12 to 16 inches in length while females grow about 50 centimeters and can uh, get about five kilograms of weight so the largest recorded specimen was about 61 centimeters or 24 inches in length and about 9.6 kilograms so the females can get quite a bit larger and they live in the brackish waters uh, of also the baltic sea they typically do not get above 20 centimeters in those areas and you can see they've got this quite round ball like body with all these like little tubercles and a knobbly um, back to them which is really interesting and the pelvic fins actually they form suction discs with their pelvic fins that allow them to um, attach, strong, uh, attach strongly to rock surfaces and uh, things like that uh, so they're quite powerful in that regard and they also have this jelly like appearance uh, with the fat under the skin and they're quite variable in color they can get this like olive color they can get yellowish greenish brownish and mature males will also turn orange orange reddish during the breeding season there's a breeding color and they have um the head and the pectoral fins and the males are larger than those in the female so males have a little bit larger pectoral fins and things like that so that's very interesting so in terms of their biology so after hatching these little guys will spend the first few months of their lives in tidal pools or in seaweed clumps and then as they grow out, they will move out into the pelagic zone and they will feed upon zooplankton, fish and small crustaceans and eggs and things like that. And as they reach maturity, they migrate back into the coastal waters and to spring to breed. And the population spawns over many months with spawning fish being caught in Iceland from March up to August. Uh, females have been spawning during the previous year tend to return in the same area when spawning occurs. And they will return at a similar amount of time of year. Uh, over the time and a single female can lay between 50,000 and 220,000 eggs which are laid in two batches uh, around a week or so from each other and the eggs are 2.2 to 2.5 millimeters in diameter and often account for one third of the female's weight before spawning so that's pretty cool these eggs are typically laid on a uh, area pre-selected by the male they usually consists of a rocky outcrop or a boulder near the seabed and they tend to nest in relatively shallow water less than about 10 meters deep or about 33 feet and maybe even in the intertidal zone as well where the male will care for the eggs and guard them and fan them with his fins uh, for the month-long uh, incubation period another weird thing about this guy as well is that they have uh, really interesting adaptions because they are a bottom dweller uh lives they typically caught in nets and things like that they lack a swim bladder as well so they can't like dive up and down like a normal fish would and um, they seem to be obviously deep to uh deep divers and deep dwellers so they live on the bottom and um they get, get, can get caught in uh bottom trawls and things like that and um, at least during the breeding season they will spend a lot of their time in the seabird but also in the pelagic zone as the fish come up close to breeding they spend a greater amount of time in the pelagic zone and with the lack of a swim bladder these guys are able to make uh rebel uh even though they lack the swim bladder they're able to make rapid movements up the water column and move between the surface waters and depths over 300 meters within a day so they're quite uh common in that regard and they seem to be a semi-pelagic semi uh bethnic fish so in that regard so they can do a little bit of both a little bit of a <laughs> all-terrain fish you could say but still really really interesting so in terms of fisheries these guys um are often hunted for their row and um approximately about 8,000 to 2,000 metric tons was ca collected from 1977 2018 and recent years iceland and greenland have become the biggest lodging fishing nations uh nations in terms of lump fish and they contribute to about over 95 percent of the historic catch uh, female fish are the main target which is utilized for the row and the caviar that they make and lump fish are targeted close to the shore when they come to spawn so that's how you get the row and tip, uh, traditionally the row would be removed at sea and the bodies disposed of and in iceland it's now mandatory for these bodies to be landed where they are now frozen and exported and mainly exported to china so in terms of their population status these guys uh, are commonly maintained because they're a fishery species so they need to be maintained the population in canada appears to be depleted and they're on the status of endangered wildlife in canada so their population there is considered threatened but there's also concerns about the population in the north or baltic seas but overall they're doing okay they are considered near threatened so there are some concerns especially in europe of their populations but they are doing okay there's not immediate risk of extinction and in terms of their uses the reason people eat the roe is that they're a good source of omega-3s and they are also used in uh, cleaner fish in um 
parasite uh, salmon farms in Iceland, Scotland, and Norway because they reduce the parasite burden on other fish since they will often eat those. And um, yeah, roe's good to eat. And the female lumpfish is actually really eaten, but when it's caught during the season, the guts are removed and um, the fish is then poached before serving sometimes. So they will sometimes eat the mother of the roe, but they typically just eat the roe, which can be a little bit wasteful to be honest, but still there. At least they're a common enough fish that it's not hurting the populations too much it seems but yeah really really awesome fish i do love my love myself a lump sucker very very cool so next fish we have got the moorish idol so you guys will recognize this guy this is the oh wait is that the right one yeah the moorish idol there we are just making sure i was thinking it might be the other fish coming up but this is the moorish idol uh if you guys seen finding nemo uh this is the one that willem defoe played uh willem the fish you could say <laughs> uh, really really awesome fish so the moorish idol uh, these guys are a very interesting fish um uh, they get their name from the moors of africa which uh believe the fish is the bringer of happiness and they're often the coveted korean fish because of their appearance that they are quite hard to keep in captivity uh, their omnivorous diet is also extremely hard to replicate in aquariums, and the vegetation of which they live on is normally experimented, um, exterminated, and they have a habit for eating corals and sponges. So, uh, yeah, really, really cool. These guys generally also live in uh, shallow waters. They prefer flat reefs. They can be found in waters from about 0 0.3 to 180 meters, so about 1 to 590 feet, in both murky and clear conditions. And their range includes East Africa in the Indian Ocean, Hawaii, Japan, Micronesia, California, Peru, uh, the Persian Gulf, all those kind of places. And they're least concerned, so they're quite common. And what really sets these guys apart is these guys have a really tall body and disc-like bodies. Uh, they also have these contrasting black and yellow white bands going around here and that makes them quite attractive They also have small fins relative to their body and they have extremely long dorsal fin here really similar to, to the banning banner fish and um, They also have this quite long um, Mouth here that you can use on these long snouts that used to eat whatever food they want and they typically differ from butterfly fish because they have a prominent uh, black uh, triangle anal fin as you can kind of see here um, the eyes of these guys are set high and they're deeply keeled body and the anal fin may have two to three spines and these guys can get quite long and um, they can get about 23 centimeters or nine inches long and the sickle like dorsal spines that you can kind of see here uh, kind of shortened with age so in terms of feeding these guys typically feed on sponges coral polyps Tunicates and other bethnic invertebrates, which is most of their diet, but they will also eat uh, algae, things like that. They're quite omnivorous. Uh, they're often seen alone, but they will form pairs or small schools on occasion, especially if they're juveniles. And they are diurnal fish, so they typically stick to the bottom of the reef at night, but they come out during the day. Uh, and then like butterfly fish, they will mate for life, and adult males will often display, uh, display aggression towards one another. So they're monogamous fish, really, really cool. These guys are pelagic spawners, so they release eggs and sperms into the water column and they leave the fertilized eggs to drift away into the current and the range uh, of these fish may extend, ex be explained by the unusually, line, uh, unusually long larval stage. So they will typically reach a length of about 7.5 centimeters before becoming free, free swimming juveniles, so that kind of explains the large range. Um, these guys are actually notoriously difficult to maintain in captivity as well. They require large tanks that may exceed 380 um, liters or like 100 gallons. And they're quite voracious eaters and destructive to corals and stuff that you try to set up. Um, some aquarists prefer to keep substitute species that look very similar, such as the um, pennant coral fish, uh, the false moor moorish idol, things like that. Just as a species is a little bit easier to keep than the normal moorish idol and obviously banner fish, things like that. And um, these guys are very picky eaters and will eat, they either eat nothing or they will eat everything. Uh, so it's kind of, you have to get it right the first time. And uh, as I mentioned, they're often, in popular culture, they are, there was one in uh, Finding Nemo named uh, Gil, who was voiced by Willem Dafoe, who was in the movie. And he was very strong desired to like escape the aquarium and then it probably alludes to their real life habits of like not being good in captivity, which is pretty interesting. And they're also quite a common reef fish because of that as well. And they're quite a long lived fish as well. Um, they have a long, eco uh, long evolutionary history, which is also very interesting. So they have a close relative of these guys, the extinct um, Isocarus, um 
Brevatoris, I believe you say that, uh, from the Middle Eocene. So they've been around for a while, so probably about like 20, uh, 55 million years is sometimes considered how long they've been around for. So uh, very, very long-lived fish in terms of time. Very, very cool. So another very cool fish to talk about. So that family of fish, like the um, Moorish idol, the banner fish, the coral fish, they're all very, very interesting. So yeah, next we're going to move it on to, uh, this was done by Leaf, Buffsu, and PC Screenshots. Next we're moving on to the tangs. We've got a couple tangs coming up. We're going to have a look at first the powder blue tang. Not the power blue tang that I keep <laughs> thinking about, but these guys are also really, really cool fish. Let's see if we can find one swimming. There's one swimming. So these guys are a marine tropical sturgeon fish. Uh, so they're also called the powder... Um, powder blue tang or the powder blue sturgeon fish. These guys reach an average length of about 23 centimeters or nine inches long, but they have this long ovu body with this tall compressed look to them, which is also very, very cool. And like other sturgeon fish, uh, they can swim with its pectoral fins and the caudal fin has a crescent shape. And they have a surgeon scalpel, uh, which is an elongated part of their spine located at the base of the tail, where they kind of get their name. They have a small and pointed mouth that's almost like a beak that is tiny and has lots of sharp teeth, so we're, we're reaching into narrow spaces to get food. Um, they also have kind of this really interesting look to them. Their pectoral fin is kind of black, uh, yellow at the base, blue at the front there. And you have the dorsal fin is quite yellowish, and then you have the bluish kind of tail there and anal fin. Uh, the pectoral fins are transparent with these yellow reflections as well. And the head, as you can see, is quite black. And they do not undergo... Um, Color changes that mature like other sturgeon and unicorn fish do. So these guys are found typically in the tropical waters of the Indian Ocean, where they inhabit clear and shallow coastal waters and reefs, so very typical coral fish. Um, and they prefer flat top reefs and areas along seaside slopes or seaward slopes. Uh, their behavior is quite similar to most species in its group, so they may, uh, the herbivores they typically eat algae. They're also diurnal, so they typically come out during the day, and they're so solitary, territorial, and aggressive to other sturgeon fish. But in cases where food is plentiful, they may feed in shoals. But this is the cases of scarcity; they may compete with each other for food, and they actually use their surgeon scalpel as a defensive weapon to uh, fight each other, which is pretty interesting. Let's have a look at this guy as he swims off. And um, in terms of the economic value, they're actually really harvested for anything other than the marine aquarium trade. Uh, they're a commonly sold fish that is kind of hard to take care of, though their popularity is easily exceeded by the yellow tang and the regal tang, or the blue tang, you know, the one that was dory. But these guys are not as popular, so they're not as very um, sought after, so that helps the populations. And they are reef safe and compatible with most species, except for other sturgeon fish. Uh, but still really, really cool. They are considered least concerned, so that collecting uh, doesn't hurt them too much, it seems. Though it locally it can, so just not over-collect from the wild, of course. A really, really awesome fish. Now moving on from the power blue, uh, powder blue tang to the yellow tang. So this is another one from Finding Nemo. <laughs> a really, really cool guy here. So um, let's have a look at these guys. So these guys are a saltwater fish, very similar to the other tangs, you know. Uh, these guys will also spawn at a full moon. Um, in terms of the description, adult fishes can get about 20 centimeters long, or about 7.9 inches, and about 1 to 2 centimeters in thickness. Adult males tend to be larger than the females, with them having this bright yellow color that you can see here. And at night, this yellow coloring actually fades, and they have a brownish patch develop on the middle uh, with a horizontal white banded well, that's pretty interesting. And then they rip, uh, regain this bright yellow color back in daylight. They can be also be aggressive and prone to marine ick, and they may damage corals within a reef tank, if they live in a reef tank, of course. And males and females look very similar, but when mating, the males can change color and have a shimmering behavior that makes them, uh, make them identifiable. And the yellow tang have about five dorsal fins, as well as 99 to 20, uh, 20, uh, 19 to 22 soft uh, anal fins, or soft rays. Uh, and they have this white spine on their caudal um, pedunctual that they can use for defense, like other sturgeon fish. And uh, in juveniles, they have like small teeth. They have two, 12 to 14 uh, upper and lower teeth, respectively, in their mouths, in their like, long mouths. And they can be... Um, relatively close together in those mouths and in the adults they have slightly more so about 18 upper and about 22 lower teeth 
and there are marine fish that lives in reefs and these guys have also been known to gather in schools and these guys are mainly herbivorous like other sturgeon fish so they'll feed on algae and um, uh, things like that which is also very interesting in terms of spawning this happens throughout the year but it peaks once spawning normally happens during the time when the moon is full and it suge suggested that these guys have a lunar periosity going on there so it times up with the uh, full moon spawning happens in pairs or in groups with uh, fertilization being external eggs are typically left in the open water with yellow blue tangs uh sub substratum like eggs um, scatterers so they basically spread their eggs into the water and just let them go off to their thing they do not guard their eggs and once the eggs hatch the juveniles do not have any parental care so in terms of their food and habitat, these guys feed on bethnic, turf, algae, and other small marine plants. So quite common in that regard. Uh, in captivity, they often are commonly fed meat or fish bait diet, but the long-term uh, health uh, effects of this is not that good. So, However, these guys uh, expect that the marine aquarium industry expressed little skepticism that such a round, rounded and bandless diet, including part and animal material, uh, material, would be detrimental to the health. So it's kind of a controversial thing in the aquarium hobby, but they should be predominantly feeding them plants because it's what they eat in the wild. Um, but they still need on occasion complex amino acids and nutrients that only ocean animals can provide, which is fair because uh, often... Uh, animals that are considered herbivorous will eat uh, plant, uh, animal matter, so like horses will eat uh, birds, uh, deer will chew on, chew on bones, it's really kind of, there's no pure herbivores or pure carnivores in the world, so yeah, I think that's also pretty interesting. And in the wild, these guys are actually a cleaner fish, so they will clear marine turtles by removing algae from their shells, so there's kind of a cute little relationship they got going on there. So in terms of their habitat, they're typically found in shallow reefs between 2 to 46 meters deep, or about 6 to 150 feet deep. And they're typically found in the Pacific Ocean, west of Hawaii and East Japan. And there have been reports of them being off the coast of Florida and the West and Central Atlantic, though that could be a introduction because of the aquarium trade. Their habitat is tropical with a temperate range of about 24 to 28 degrees and Hawaii is the most common place where these guys are harvested where up to 70% of the yellow tangs where the uh, in the aquarium industry are sourced from and over that 70 years a natural range is protected uh, from collecting and fishing with these guys luckily listed as least concern uh, by the IUCN so though they are collected as long as they are uh, collected sustainably they will be fine and you can see that large kind of fish is there very very interesting and um in terms of predators and other threats they have many natural predators that include sharks larger fish crabs and um, octopuses another threat is habitat destruction by humans by coral bleaching as harvesting as well snorkeling can potentially cause reef damage as well uh, pollution things like that is always affecting these populations of coral which in turn infects these populations of fish so in terms of their conservation status, uh, because even though they consider least concern, they are protected in many ways. And the most prominent way is that these guys are luckily bred in captivity uh, a lot more than they used to. So they don't really take as, as from the wild as much as uh, they used to, so we can breed them in captivity. So collecting them from the ocean has decreased sharply, and this allows them to thrive without too much being taken, and the species being more likely to survive. And one study actually found that fish larvae can drift from ocean currents and reseeds fish stocks in distant locations. So it seems that even though uh, are, they could become locally extinct in the area, um, larvae can drift across the ocean and settle in these areas, even though that population may have been gone. So that actually really helps, um, especially with populations that have been heavily fished, they can be seeded from other places, which is also very cool. And in aquariums, these guys are typically kept in, of course, saltwater aquariums, and they've been successfully bred in captivity uh, in 2015. These guys are now routinely available from fish stores and online vendors, where they can grow up to 8 inches in the wild, but introduced in aquariums, they get to about 2 to 4 inches, with some specimens getting as large as about 6 inches available. Uh, they're not quite as large um, as they would be in the wild and life expectancy in the wild can be over 30 years so they're quite a long-lived fish very very cool um and this guy's also from uh the other fish you know um in finding nemo well i don't know the name of it it's like that crazy one uh, but really really awesome cool fish it's like my bubbles my bubbles my bubbles so he, that guy was a yellow ta yellow tang but last but certainly not least we have got the white marlin. So this, these last two were done by Leaf, Buffsu, and PC Screenshot. So the power blue tang, 
the uh, powder blue tang, the yellow tang, and the Moorish idol. This last one was done by Leaf, Buff Sue, and the 3D job team. This is the white marlin, as we can kind of spot in here. So, really, really awesome fish here. So these guys, also known as the Atlantic White Marlin, or just the Marlin, these guys are a billfish that are found in the tropical and subtropical areas of the Atlantic Ocean. They are typically found in latitudes 45 north and 45 south and waters deeper than 100 meters. And even though they're found in bodies of water deeper than 100 meters, they actually tend to stay near the surface. And these guys also commonly are misidentified as the round scale, uh, round scale spearfish. And there's likely a miscount of the population of white marlins that was determined to be different in 2001, but they generally considered it different species. So uh, in terms of these guys, their scientific name is the Tichoporus uh, albinus, or aldabinus, or aldadurus, I believe you say that, um, is accepted name for white marlin to 2006, where they have been classified in the genus um, Carnagura. So today uh, the... Carnagura um, albinia and the close relative Carnagura albex, which is the striped marlin, they've been considered different from the genus Tetra pururus, so that's kind of changed genus. And these guys actually have quite a long history. Um, the genus that they were from seems to be as old as the uh, like 15 million years ago, so that's like uh, not Eocene, that's it's for 15 million, that's the Miocene. And they have relatives from as early as 56 million years ago, so right after the extinction of the dinosaurs. So in terms of these guys in size, they're mid-sized billfish. They typically get to about, uh, their largest size is about 2.8 meters, about 9 feet long, and they get about 82 kilograms. Uh, in that regard, mid-size, they have this very long, like very much like other billfish, they have this very long bill here that's very used to like um, swim around and kind of shock prey and spear prey and things like that. Um, but they don't really spear prey with it, they kind of just use it to try and shoal them and things like that. They typically have this common counter shading color that most deep uh, fish have. They have the lighter underside and darker top that helps them uh, camouflage into the water with these stripes as well. That's very interesting. They also have this ray fins that that's very tall there that helps with their um, swimming because they are very fast swimmers. And they actually do not have a swim bladder as well, but they have a small bubble shaped chamber uh, in their in their chambers in their body that acts as swim bladder and similar to most vertebrates they have symmetrical gonads and while other marine fish uh they do not have gill rakers and they actually um involved in suspension feeding and what these guys do will have sh more but sharp teeth that they use when they eat fish and cephalopods so that's, that's typically their diet so they're typically as i mentioned found across the uh, atlantic ocean so they can be found in the gulf of mexico the mediterranean the caribbean and um they can actually be found as far north as Brittany in france uh, that they're considered vagrants so another very awesome fish uh in terms of their diet these guys are near the top of the food chain so quite a uh they will eat anything that they can eat uh fit in their mouth really so they'll eat schooling uh fish such as flying fish uh, small tuna, mahi-mahi, squid are also quite common diet for these guys. And they actually sometimes forage with the help of other predators. And white marlin usually keep to themselves, but they will associate with other apex predators when there's like a big bait ball going on uh, for foraging. And they often attain food by diving down in a V or U-shaped pattern at about 200 meters in search of food, uh, and that's not at the surface. And they actually are su survive in lower temperatures and darker environments. Um, they have larger eyes and a way to keep their eyes warm uh, and brain tissues warm. So they've got regional endothermia, I believe. So yeah, that's how they typically hunt their prey. They typically use it to shoal together and then attack it, which is very interesting. They're quite fast as well. Marlin are very, very fast. The group itself is like the fastest group of fish. So they're able to use that to chase prey. In terms of the life cycle, these guys... Be uh, begins a large spawning in the warm tropical waters near the equator with females laying between 190,000 to 586,000 eggs and there's a few locations known for spawning such as the Gulf of Mexico, Bermuda, the Grand Bahama Islands, stuff like that. They return to these waters each year to spawn and the growth of white marlin is very very rapid. Let's see if we can find one swimming off. So this guy's having to sleep but we'll watch them swim off. The growth is very rapid. Males will reach sexual maturity at about 153 centimeters and females about 189 centimeters. And they have been identified to have a lifespan of about 15 or more years, so a long-lived fish. These guys are ram ventilators. That means they have to be constantly moving to breathe. And many have made long transatlantic journeys with one traveling about 6,000 uh, kilometers or about 4,000 miles where it was tagged 478, uh, four days ago. So a little over a year and a half, these guys were 
kind of a little under a year and a half actually. They were quite long, big swimmers. So in terms of their conservation, these guys are um, were identified as the same species prior to 2001, but they were obviously shown as different. Uh, these guys are considered vulnerable, sadly, because of uh, Marlin Fishing is like a hundred multi-million dollar organization and restrictions in place to limit the fish and the size and things like that have been taken. But these pro uh, angling uh, processes have been very devastating to the fish. The time, they can be very stressful for them, things like that. And there's been lots of regulations around that. And there's been worry about that being over the top. Also, these guys are accidentally caught in bycatch. Uh, about 90% of their population is actually caught in bycatch. Uh, of the annual catch is caught in these bycatch. So it's not the anglers really going out killing them. They only account for 10% or so of the uh, uh, white marlin caught. And the time they spend at the hook, all that can be very um, stressful for them. And they're caught in gill nets, which means they can't swim, which means they can't breathe, which means they die. And uh, that's led to some decreases in populations as well. And they become also become for food for pilot whales, killer whales, and sharks. And uh, because of this decrease, uh, a lot of people have been trying to come up with ways to allow these guys to swim out of nets, things like that, and educate about their role in ecosystems and things like that, because they're a very important fish in uh, local leaky systems and stuff like that. So really, really awesome fish. I want to see him just go out and have a swim before we leave. But yeah, really, really awesome fish. Uh, quite a fast fish, as I mentioned. Uh, typical of marlin. And they're kind of those ram feeders that run up and stuff like that. They don't really spear too much with that, but they allows them to go through the water and they can slam fish with it. It's pretty cool. But yeah, really, really awesome fish. Again, done by Leaf Buffsu and the 3D Job Team. So um, yeah, I think this will be a great place to end the video. So um, I uh, really, really, really hope you guys enjoyed this video. I hope you guys like and subscribe. Always remember to hit the little bell icon to get notified about anything. So yeah, I hope you guys enjoyed this video. Hope you guys like and subscribe. And bye bye.